Okay, welcome everybody. If you'd open your Bibles, please. As you can see on the screen behind me, uh, today we will be studying 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, a text of Scripture that I am certain you all are very familiar with. Let's read our text, and then let's dig into our text. Starting in verse 4, the Apostle Paul, in the under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, declared, Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people say, Amen. Okay. Well, as you can see on the screen behind me, the title of this message is When Love is Flourishing. If you were with us last week, you'll recall that the title of our message was When Love is Lacking. We started chapter 13 last week, and we just took a look at the first three verses where Paul was rebuking the Corinthians there in the church, the Corinthians who were lusting for the gifts which they thought were the greater ones, you know, like tongues and prophecy. And Paul rebuked them because the Corinthians were more enamored with the gifts of the Spirit than they were with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, we saw last week in verses 1 through 3 that Paul rebuked them because their love was lacking. They were using their spiritual gifts, but not with love. And if you recall in verse 1, Paul said to them, you can have the gift of tongues, but if you have no love, Paul said, you're, you're nothing but a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, Paul said, do you have the gift of prophecy? And if you use this gift to the most exaggerated extreme, but if you have no love, Paul said, you're nothing. Verse 3, Paul said, you can have the gift of giving. You can even give yourself over to be burned at the stake. But if you have no love, Paul said at the end of verse 3. It profits you nothing. Paul started out chapter 3 rebuking the Corinthians. He used himself as the example. If I have the gift of tongues, if I have the gift of prophecy, if I uh, give all my possessions to help the poor, but if I have no love, Paul said, I'm nothing but a, but a, but a bunch of noise. I'm nothing. It profits me nothing. He used himself as the example as he was rebuking those selfish, self-centered, listen, loveless Christians in that church. Again, they were enamored with the gifts of the Spirit in particular. You know, the miraculous gifts, the healing, performing miracles, speaking in tongues, prophecy. They were enamored with those gifts of the Spirit at the expense of the fruit of the Spirit. And so last week we saw how Paul rebuked them 
and he showed them what happens when love is lacking. This week, our text for today, verses 4 through 7, Paul's going to give them a picture of what it looks like when love is flourishing. And again, this is a text I'm certain you all are very familiar with. You've been at weddings where these verses were read. Perhaps your own wedding, you had these verses that we're going to study today. You had them read. And what I want to do, if you want to take note, let me kind of just break down these verses for you. In verses 4 through 7, Paul gives 15 characteristics of love. 15 characteristics. And those 15 characteristics are broken down where we see seven are stated in the positive. Verse 4, love is patient. It's stated in the positive. Love is kind. It's stated in the positive. End of verse 6. Love rejoices with the truth. It's stated in the positive. And then all of verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Of the 15 characteristics of love that we're going to study today, Seven of those characteristics, the first two and the last five in this list, are stated in the positive. The other eight characteristics are stated in the negative. Back up to verse 4. After Paul said, love is patient, love is kind, here we go. The next eight are stated in the negative. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Verse 5, love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. And then the beginning of verse 6, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. So do you see the, the, the breakdown here? 15 characteristics of love. Seven of those characteristics are stated in the positive. Eight are stated in the negative. Now, I'm going to ask you to underline uh, the characteristic which many commentators have, have called the apex of these 15 characteristics. Would you please underline in the middle of verse 5 where Paul says that love is not provoked. Love is not provoked. Now, why do commentators call that statement or that characteristic kind of the apex of these 15 characteristics? Well, the first seven characteristics, love is patient, love is kind, it's not jealous, does not brag, it's not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own. There's your first seven. And then, love is not provoked. And then we come back down with the final seven. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Do you see how Paul masterfully, obviously under the power of the Holy Spirit, how Paul starts out with the first seven characteristics, building his way up. Two of them are stated in the positive, five of them in the negative. He then comes to the apex. Love is not provoked. And then from there, he concludes with the last seven of the characteristics. 
Now, why do commentators say that that's the apex there? Seven up, seven down, right there in the middle. Love is not provoked. That's because the Corinthians were emotional volcanoes spewing their lava everywhere. They were easily provoked. Some in the church, if you recall, oh, we like Paul's our pastor. Oh, we like Peter. Or we like Apollos. They were just emotional volcanoes. Remember they had disagreements with each other in the church? What did they do? Did they try to sell, settle those disagreements in love? No. Uh, they were taking each other to court, suing each other before non-believers. You see how easily provoked they were? Remember in chapters 8 through 10, we saw that the mature believers had no time, no interest in trying to protect the weak consciences of the younger believers. You know, the younger believers who were really getting upset when they saw the mature believers eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. The mature believers, they were easily provoked. That's not our problem. We don't care. And then remember in chapter 11, what they were doing with the Lord's Supper? Some of the rich people in the church were bringing food early and, and wine for the love feast. And instead of saving some of that for the poor in the church, instead the rich people were gluttonous fools, eating all the food, drinking all the wine, and then going to the Lord's Supper as drunk. Arrogant fools. They were, in a, they were emotionally volcanic, exploding everywhere. And then in our section now, Spiritual Gifts, chapters 12 through 14, we've already studied how they were lusting for what they thought were the greater gifts. They weren't satisfied with the gifts that the Holy Spirit had already distributed to them according to His will. No, no, no. They wanted more. They didn't want to serve people. They didn't want to, you know, be humble and, and give themselves in service to others. No. They wanted to be in the spotlight. They wanted the showy gifts, tongues, prophecy, miracles, healings. And they were easily provoked. So again, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 15 characteristics of love. Seven are stated in the positive, eight in the negative, and the apex, many commentators agree, is that one right there in the middle. After stating seven, and then concluding with seven right there in the middle, Paul says to those Corinthians, oh, by the way, love, when it's flourishing, is not provoked. And they, Paul's statement there hit them right between the eyes because they were very, very easily provoked. Does that make sense? Now, one last thing I want to draw your attention to. Of these 15 characteristics of love, did you notice that all of these characteristics, the verbs, are action verbs? Love is patient. Notice he didn't say love feels patient. No, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. All 15 characteristics are action verbs, which tells you what? Love is not simply a feeling. as the culture tries to tell you. No, love is active. It's not passive. Love is dynamic. It is not dormant. Love is not simply based on feelings. Because think about your feelings. 
they fluctuate. And none of us have an excuse, especially in our marriages, to not be active in our love. We don't have an excuse to say, ah, I just don't feel like loving my spouse right now. Think of God's love, Christian. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. It's only begotten son. Think of John 15, 13, Jesus said, no greater love is there than this, than one to lay down his life for another. Think of Romans 5, verse 8, for God demonstrates his love for us in this way. That while we were still sinners, hopeless, helpless, powerless, enemies of God, Christ died for us. Do you see God's love? Active, not passive. And didn't Jesus say in John 14, several times, that the way we show love to him is how? We have his word and we actively in the power of the spirit strive to obey his word do you see the action love is not simply a feeling i have to tell you as a pastor i've had many many examples or i should say i have many examples where i've done marital counseling and there are problems in a marriage and inevitably it's because people are basing their love on feelings. And I think those of you who are married for a while, you'll agree with this following statement. You know, when you first start dating your future spouse and then you get engaged and then you get married, boy, the feelings are great, aren't they? <laughs> and then reality sets in, <laughs> right? And that's when true love needs to flourish. That's when our love needs to manifest itself following the example of our Lord. Action, not feelings. Does that make sense? So 15 characteristics of love, seven stated in the positive, eight stated in the negative. The kind of apex statement, love is not provoked. We know why Paul said that to them. And in all 15 characteristics, we see that they are stated as action verbs. And before we get into our text, let me just throw out a disclaimer here. Guys, I feel convicted every time I either study or teach these 15 characteristics <laughs> because my love is lacking in many of these areas. Can anybody relate? And so as I'm about to teach these characteristics to you, you have to understand something. I'm learning alongside of you. And if my wife <laughs> could come up here right now, she'd go, yep, believe him what he just said. It's, it's a lifelong challenge, but it's worth it, right? And so that's why it is so important to follow up on what we talked about last week. We always need to strive to be filled with the Spirit so that we are able to bear fruit of the Spirit. Again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And we saw last week being filled with the Spirit is a command, Ephesians 5. And we saw last week in Colossians 3 how we can be filled with the Spirit. The Word of Christ needs to richly dwell within us so that once you're filled with the Spirit, and it's a continuous thing, you can start to bear 
the fruit of the Spirit. doesn't mean that your love is going to be perfect here, but your love will flourish more and more according to these characteristics here. But we don't sit back and say, okay, I'm just waiting for it to happen. No, we have a role in this. Again, we need to be filled with the Spirit so we can bear the fruit of the Spirit. Make sense? Good. All right, let's dig into our verses. And it's very simple here. Let's just look at the first five characteristics in verse 4, 2, which are stated in the positive, uh, 3, which are stated in the negative. Love is patient. Macrothumeo. It comes from macrothumeo, which means long-suffering. Think of God's long-suffering patience. Where every day he is being blasphemed, ridiculed, ignored, laughed at. And God doesn't incinerate those people. He doesn't bring an end to this world. He doesn't yet usher in the eternal state. Why? You can write this down. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God's patience, God's macrothumeo patience, means salvation. Why does God, who is holy, righteous, and just, why does He continue to be patient? While the majority of the world blasphemes Him? Because God has more of His elect that He's going to bring into the fold. Think about God's patience. Again, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. God's patience means salvation. Christian, can you only imagine if God's macrothumeo patience would have come to an end, let's say, a hundred years ago? Fifty years ago? 25 years ago. Some of us were outside the family of God at that point. Praise the Lord for His macro through mayo patience. Amen. Love is Christian. Number two, love is kind. Uh, it comes from the Greek word krestos, which means um, benev uh, benevolent, serving in a selfless, benevolent, loving way. You can write down Titus. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, where Scripture declares, But when the kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not based upon our works, but because of His grace, His mercy. Love is patient. Oh, it's not a feeling. It is active long-suffering. Love is kind. It acts in a benevolent way even when those we're being kind to maybe haven't acted like they deserve it, right? Think of the kindness of God our Savior bestowed upon us. Bestowed upon us people who didn't deserve it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Next one, number three, stated in the negative. It is not what? Jealous. Some of your Bible translations say envious. Same thing. 
Love is not jealous. Love does not envy. What is the color of envy? <laughs> green. Love is not green, right? Now, some of you say, well, wait a second. Scripture says that God is jealous. Well, of course. But his jealousy is not green <laughs> in, a, in a sinful way, obviously. He is jealous for his holy name, but rightfully so, because there is no one who is holy as God is holy. His jealousy is for his holiness. No one belongs before God, beside God, above God. Because he is the only infinitely pure and perfect, transcendent, divine, triune being. And he will not allow his glory to be shared with anyone. That's holy jealousy. But unfortunately for many of us, we get green with envy. Not because we want to protect the holiness of God, but rather we're more concerned about ourselves. Can anybody relate? Scripture here says love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Number four, it doesn't brag doesn't puff itself up, doesn't point to oneself and say, look at me how great I am. And number five, love is not arrogant. It does not look down in a condescending way on others. You see the problem with those Corinthians back then is they were hot-headed and empty-hearted. Their love wasn't patient. Their love wasn't kind. Their love was green with envy and jealousy. And their love puffed themselves up. And all the while, they arrogantly looked down on others. Do you understand our first five characteristics? Before we go to the next group, let's just plug in a name right here in verse five or verse four. The name of Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is not jealous. Jesus doesn't brag. And Jesus is not arrogant. Do you dare plug your name into those first five characteristics? <laughs> I'll spare you the pain for now. Let's go to verse five. Again, we continue where these characteristics are stated in the negative. Love does not act unbecomingly. Some of your Bible versions say uh, indecently or rudely. All of those are okay. Love does not act indecently. Love is not rude. Love does not act unbecomingly. As Christians, we represent Christ. We don't want to act indecently. We don't want to act rudely. We don't want to act unbecomingly. We want to be people who revere our triune God. We want to be people of dignity. We want to be people when we're out there in the non-believing world. We want to represent our Redeemer. Love does not act unbecomingly. Listen not only out there amongst the wolves, but also it doesn't act unbecomingly in your family, in your home. 
Next characteristic, once again stated in the negative. Love does not seek its own. Love is not selfish. It is not self-seeking. Think of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Think of the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though equal, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, consubstantial of the same essence of the Father and the Holy Spirit, though co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial 2,000 years ago, the second person of the Trinity left the glory of heaven and he humbled himself by taking on flesh. He humbled himself by submitting to the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit and he humbled himself becoming obedient. Obedient even to death on the cross to save lost sinners, Christian, like you and me. And I have a problem humbly serving others, selflessly giving of myself and using my gifts to benefit others. I have a problem with that. When I think about what the Good Shepherd did for me, one of his lost sheep? How about you? Again, verse 5, love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. And then the apex statement to the Corinthians, love is not provoked. Not easily stirred to anger. Which again, the Corinthians were easily provoked and stirred to anger, right? Now again, we see examples in Scripture of our Lord being provoked. But obviously it wasn't sinful. Think about it in the temple. Not once, but twice. Beginning of his earthly ministry and then at the end of his earthly ministry. Our Lord cleansed the temple. Why? Because the religious leaders turned God's house into a den of thieves. He was provoked, but it was holy, righteous anger. Think of the Apostle Paul when he arrived in Athens, Acts 17. He saw a city filled with idols, and he was provoked. Why? Because of all that idolatry and how God's name was not being honored. Well, these Corinthians, as we have studied, <laughs> I, they were easily provoked, not for the glory of God's name and holiness, not because they were upset about all idolatry was happening there in Corinth. And, no, no, no. They were easily provoked because they weren't getting things that they wanted. They were self-seeking, self-centered, they wanted the, the super gifts. Again, they didn't want to serve and help and administrate. Some wanted to be apostles. Some wanted to be prophets. They wanted the gift of tongues. They prophecy, miracles, healings. Paul said, whoa. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. And then end of verse 5, continuing where he states a characteristic of love in the negative, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. The Greek does not take into account logizomai. It comes from Bookkeeping. Think of bookkeepers. A little different now because you have computers and all that, but think back how bookkeepers kept track of everything. 
they had a ledger. A ledger where they wrote down, okay, let's say income, let's say expenses, let's say debts owed by others to them. The bookkeeper kept a ledger. And very often the bookkeeper would go back to that ledger to be reminded of everything that he or she wrote down, right? Well, that's good in the bookkeeping world. But in the Christian world, especially in marriage, Christian You better not pull out that ledger. And start reminding your spouse of what he or she did or said 15, 20 years ago. If you forgave that, then forget that and don't pull out the ledger. Again, my experience marital counseling, this is a huge problem in marriages. I can't tell you how many times I, I've listened to spouses right in front of me, just rem reminding each other of stuff done or said 15, 20, 25 years earlier. Suddenly the ledgers came out. And what do you think about that anger that was starting to stir and explode, right? Look, I'm not saying that, you know, if somebody has done something wrong to you, that, you know, you just act like carpet and let that person continue to do that. No. But look, if you have forgiven that, you have forgiven that. I mean, think about our Lord. What did he declare before he gave up his spirit? Paid in full to tell us that. He died, but three days later he rose in victory. Demonstrating that he paid for our sins in full in terms of that day of judgment. Can you imagine? Like our Lord? Like pulling out the ledger and saying, well, Andrew. Whew. Now, if anybody had the right to do that, it would be him, right? But, I mean, think about on that day, Judgment Day, when the ledger is open, the books are open. Christian, over every one of your sins, it's going to be stamped, paid in full. Praise God! Christ redeemed his sheep. He paid for our sins. Listen, once for all time. Well, we who are recipients of that type of unmerited mercy, grace, and love from our triune God, if we who are recipients of that, well, wait, wait a second. Okay, it's good the God kind of puts away the ledger, or doesn't keep bringing it, but well, I can do that. I have the right to. Really? No, no, no. Scripture says, love does not act unbecomingly, verse 5. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. How have you been doing, Christian? on these characteristics we just saw in verse 5 over the last week, two weeks. Let's put in the name of Jesus, verse 5. Jesus never acted unbecomingly, right? Jesus did not seek his own. He said, I did not come to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus did not seek his own. Jesus was not provoked. Again, when he saw 
the temple being turned into a den of thieves, that was holy provocation. But think about how our Lord acted when it came to those scribes and Pharisees who kept saying that everything Jesus was doing was the power of the devil. And think about all of that. And he didn't incinerate them right on the spot. Jesus, not easily provoked. And Jesus does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now, he did take it into account in a very special way, right? He came to save sinners like you and me who piled up debt against God, our crimes against God, that were all written in the ledger. Debt that needs to be paid, crimes that need to be appeased and paid for. We couldn't do it. So how about this? The perfect one of heaven, Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, fulfilled all righteousness for us in our place, and then he went to the cross. And how about this? All those sins in that ledger of God? God's just ledger? God's righteous ledger? God's holy ledger? Those sins were placed on Christ instead, and God's wrath was poured out on Christ instead of on us. Christ declared, paid in full. Pray. Verse 6, the last of our eight characteristics, which are stated in the negative, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Well, that makes sense. Unrighteousness, evil, some of your Bible translations say. Well, who's evil? Satan. Love does not rejoice in the things of Satan, right? But rather, now we come to the positive again. Love rejoices with the truth. Well, that makes sense because God is the God of truth. He is truth. We don't rejoice in evil. We rejoice in truth. We don't rejoice in the father of lies. We rejoice in God who is truth. And then verse 7, love bears all things. Interesting. These last four, notice, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all all things, endures all things. Back up to bears all things. Uh, bears, it comes from the Greek word, uh, it comes from stego, uh, which means um, to cover. Uh, I like to use the illustration. Uh, we saw the, the ledger, right? Okay, we don't want to open that ledger and remind people of stuff that we claim was forgiven, right? Stego, from Stego, bears all things. If we have covered those sins, forgiven them, a sin that, or a wrong that maybe your spouse committed against you, if you have covered that, if you have forgiven that, don't take the shovel out back and redig it up. Love bears all things. Again, this is a huge problem in many marriages. Not only do people pull out the ledger and remind each other of stuff that happened 30 years ago in the marriage, then they go out and get the shovel and start digging up stuff that they have supposedly forgiven, covered, and concealed. Praise God that he doesn't pull out the shovel and start digging up, oof, right? And when it comes to us. Not only does love bear all things, love believes all things. He's not saying here that as Christians we are to just be, you know, gullible and lack discernment. No. Believes all things. You can write down Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, uh, verses you're very familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. 
trusting that he will straighten out your paths. Love believes all things. That as you and I pursue in the power of the Spirit this type of love, we will trust in the Lord regardless of how others respond. We will trust in the Lord. We will not lean on our own understanding, but we will acknowledge Him in every way because we believe that our God is sovereign. We believe that our God can move any human heart. We believe that God knows all things, sees all things. Our love not only bears all things, we're not digging up things that we've covered. Our love also believes all things. We believe that God is actively involved. He is sovereign over every human and over every human challenge and problem you and I may be facing right now. Last two, love endures all things. Or I'm sorry, uh, before that, love hopes all things. Uh, hope, it comes from elpis. It doesn't mean like, well, I hope the weather's going to be nice. Today. No, no. Elpis, uh, I was going to say in the Croatian language, sigurnos, which means certainty. Biblical hope is certainty. Certainty in that God exists. Certainty that that which God promises in his word, he will fulfill. Certainty, when Christ said, paid in full, that it's paid in full. So love, hopes, is certain. Has confident expectation that God is sovereign, that God is moving, that that which God has eternally decreed will come to pass. That as we submit to the Word of God and walk in the power of the Spirit, as we bear the fruit of the Spirit, we can be certain that we're doing what God wants us to do and we can trust Him with the results. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And our final characteristic, love endures all things. In other words, Christian, the second you have problems in your relationships, you don't say, I'm out of here, I'm done. You imagine if God did that with us? Love endures all things. Look, in marriage, sparks are gonna fly. I mean, I know that when Daniel and I, well, let's put it this way, before Daniel and I ever met, guess what? She and I never had an argument. <laughs> Why? We didn't know each other. But then we started to get to know each other. We got engaged. We got married. We moved to Croatia. We're stuck in a little apartment by ourselves as newlyweds. Couldn't talk to anybody out there. We didn't know the language. We didn't even know where to go. Well, the good news is we got closer to each other. But what happens when you get closer? Sparks start to fly. And it's funny, what that's kind of when you go. Oh, the feelings aren't like they were before. Exactly, because now love has to actively kick in. And try to be patient and kind. And don't be easily provoked and don't pull out the ledger and don't take out the shovel and dig things up and all that. You know, love endures all things. Before Danielle and I got married, I said, Danielle, in the Vuxic household, we're going to have just a few rules because ultimately the canon of Scripture <laughs> is the plumb line of how we're going to live. But I said, Danielle, one thing that will never come out of our mouths is that D word, divorce, even in a joking way. I have sat with couples at a restaurant and... They're joking back and forth, and they're just throwing that D word around everywhere. Listen, gang. And even though they were joking, the more you say that D word, the easier it is for you to say it when you're provoked. 
For me and my household, we're going to honor and serve the Lord, and we will never, even in a joking way, bring up that D word because we made a covenant before God, before the people who came, and before each other. We are in our marriage for life. And we are committed in the power of the Spirit to actively love, though imperfectly, but nevertheless actively pursue this type of love. There's no easy out. Hey, I don't feel like it's... Whoa! Whoa! You Christians who are married, your marriage is meant to represent Christ and honor Christ and bring glory to Christ. Think about Christ, how he bore all things. Think about Christ, how he endured all things for us. And so, do you understand the 15 characteristics? <laughs> As you're now depressed, going, oh, well... Let me help you out here. We had plugged in Jesus' name and all 15 characteristics, right? He is perfect in his love, infinitely perfect in his love, right? We're not. Though, as we have seen, God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Though we know that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbors, ourselves, we know that, but we still have a sin nature. And so, we want our love more and more to flourish according to these characteristics. But we all struggle, don't we? As I said at the beginning, that includes me. So I'll put my name in. I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the pain. Back up to verse 4. Andrew is patient. Oish. Andrew is kind. He's not jealous. He doesn't brag. He's not arrogant. Ugh. A lot of work to do in these areas. How about you? Let's go to verse 5. Andrew does not act unbecomingly. Andrew does not seek his own. He's not easily provoked. He does not take into account a wrong suffered. Yep, I've got some work in these areas. How about you? Verses 6 and 7. Andrew does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but he rejoices with the truth. Andrew bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Oh. Yep, I've got some work to do. How about you? That's why it is critical, as we saw last week, and I'll conclude today, with this idea, this command of Scripture. We must be filled with the Spirit constantly where the Word of Christ is richly dwelling, tabernacling within us. Because again, as we are filled with the Spirit, we bear the fruit of the Spirit. And suddenly, Spirit-filled people bearing the fruit of the Spirit, the ninefold manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. Let's go back up to verse 4. As Christians, our love then can become more and more patient. It won't be perfect on this side of heaven, but it be, can become more and more patient when we're filled with the Spirit. Our love can become more and more kind. We can be less and less jealous, braggadocious, and arrogant. Verse 5, we will start to act more and more with dignity and honor and reverence and less and less rudely and unbecomingly. When you're filled with the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit, less and less you're seeking for your own. Less and less you are easily stirred to anger and provoked. Less and less do you pull out the ledger and take into account a wrong suffered. Verse 6, when you're filled with the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit, 
So you're not rejoicing in unrighteousness, but more and more you're rejoicing with the truth. And then verse 7, when you're filled with the Spirit and bearing fruit of the Spirit, more and more you're bearing all things. More and more you're believing all things. More and more you're hoping all things. More and more you are enduring all things. Do you see it? We saw Jesus in these 15 characteristic, characteristics. Infinitely perfect love. We took a look at Andrew, these 15 characteristics. <laughs> and I'll take a wild guess. You can be in that category with Andrew, right? <laughs> I don't know what I just said. <laughs> Speaking in tongues. Well, actually, we'll talk about that next week. But listen, gang, though we will never be able to perfectly love with the infinite perfect love of Christ, nevertheless, we can start to bear more and more of these characteristics. These characteristics can flourish more and more in our lives. But we need help. But here's the good news, Christian. You have the helper, third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And as we're filled with the Spirit, guess what? Your love's going to flourish. Now hop over to Galatians chapter 5, and I'll conclude here. Again, last week we saw this idea, this command of being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5. We then went to Colossians 3, verse 16, and saw, how does that look? How are you filled with the Spirit? The Word of Christ richly dwells within you. Well, here in Galatians 5, we see Paul saying in verse 16 to the Corinthians, but I say, walk by the Spirit. That's another way of saying, be filled with the Spirit. How, are you, how do you walk by the Spirit? How are you filled with the Spirit? The word of Christ richly dwelling within you. Again, it's a command. It's in the continuous uh, uh, tense so that you need to constantly be filled with and walk by the Spirit. Why? So that you don't carry out the desire of your sin nature. Do you see it? You see, our sin nature wants to love. But love ourselves. Oh, I can be patient with myself. I can be kind to myself. I can endure all kinds of things when it comes to Andrew. But when it comes to others, and sometimes even towards God, and that's... <laughs> Man, I need help. How about you? We need help. Our marriages need help. Our families need help. Our churches need help. Christian, we have the helper. But we've got a role here. You've got to walk by the Spirit so that we do not carry out the desire of our sin nature. Because verse 17, our sin nature sets its desire against the Spirit in us and the Spirit against the sin nature, for they are in opposition to one another. Do you see it? So every day, Christian, we have a battle within, the believer's battle inside of us. Our sin nature doesn't want to love like we saw in those 15 characteristics in 1 Corinthians 13. No. Our sin nature wants to love us, ourselves. Our sin nature wants self-love. But the Holy Spirit wants you to have love towards God and others. And the Holy Spirit can empower you to do so. Again, we're not going to be perfect. But we can flourish more and more when it comes to these 15 characteristics of love. But guys, we have a believer's battle going on inside of us. That's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, right? So that, go to verse 22. We can bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, right? And then verse 25 and 26, Paul said, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit so that we're not boastful, verse 26, challenging, provoking one another and being green with envy. Why don't you all spend some time right now in silent prayer with the Lord?
think about your love over the past week or two towards God and towards others. Others in your home, in your extended family. Others at work, in your church. What would you say about that love? Is it flourishing or lacking? If it's lacking, well, you know how to work on that. Be filled with the Spirit constantly so you can bear the fruit of the Spirit in the power of the Holy Spirit and all for the glory of our triune God. Amen.